One of the features of many of the talks on astronomy is the enormous timescales involved with cosmic objects. Stars are born, even the actual act of being born takes them several sort of million years to get their act together. They will live for millions, tens of millions, billions of years before dying away in a supernova explosion. Galaxies will collide and change and evolve, but again on timescales of hundreds of millions of years to billions of years. These are all enormous timescales, far different from anything that we experience here on Earth. And whether we actually see anything change is very much a matter of luck and kind of what the object is. Whether you happen to be looking at, have your telescope trained just on a distant galaxy at the time that a supernova goes off is a matter of luck, or whether something happens nearby to you in the universe so that you can't miss it happening when it does. All of this brings an element of serendipity to the whole idea of watching things change, anything happen <laughs> eventually in astronomy. But there is this growing field of time domain astronomy, looking for changes within astronomical objects. And it's becoming a very important part of astronomy. It's becoming a new dimension in astronomy. And this is because now we're building up archives of data. We now have digital detectors in all large telescopes and satellites. We accumulate archives over several decades. From that beforehand, we've got photographic plates that we can now compare. We can begin to track changes in objects over a period of decades. So again, spans of a few human lifetimes. And then there's that element of luck which we're also trying to remove by having new suites of instruments, robotic telescopes, automated facilities that scan the sky all the time. Scan the sky not just in visible wave bands, but in other wave bands, and looking for that transient behavior that marks the changes within cosmic objects. And the kind of changes I'm talking about here, well, obviously there's changes in brightness, but beyond that, you can have changes in color, changes in shape, changes in motion, changes in the spectrum of the object. All of these can be tracked and mapped. And this really is a, a new kind of astronomy. Obviously, there are many changes that we're aware of within our own solar system. You know, we can see the moons of Jupiter move around the giant planet. We can see comets grow tails and then fade away again. We can even see changes on the sun. Outside the solar system, there are various changes in objects, for example, stars, binary systems of stars that go around each other, like the very famous Algol system that some of you may know of, where you've got two stars of very different colors in a binary system, perpetual orbit around each other, giving a sort of variability to the star. Or maybe where an exoplanet around another star moves in front of the disk and dims its light occasionally. Those are not the kind of variations I'm going to talk about today. I'm not going to talk about objects within our solar system. I'm going to concentrate on objects that are further out within our galaxy and then out beyond our galaxy, extragalactic objects, and concentrate on changes that are revealing something about the object itself or the very nearby environment of that object. And as you discover, some of these are the most spectacular changes anywhere in the universe. And I've called this the transient universe, but be aware there are two kinds of behavior that I'm really looking at today. One is the variability, where something will go into periodic outbursts and its brightness or its behavior is changing all the time. And then there's a the one-off events, the outbursts, and these are the real transients, things which just flare up for sometimes a fraction of a second and then completely fade away again. So again, transient and variable behavior. Now we have, I know I said I was going to talk about things within our solar system, but just to remind you, our sun is a star, and even that exhibits some variable behavior. It follows uh, you know, different changes on its surface, sunspots, all due to its magnetic activity. It follows a regular period of variability. Not just that, every so often the sun will output enormous bursts of energy, which are called solar flares, where radiation, very energetic radiation, the X-rays is released and beamed out throughout the solar system. But the sun is not that dramatic a star. There are other stars that go into much greater variability and also undergo much more spectacular outbursts. So for example, I'd like to introduce you to, I'm going to get the name right, DGCVN. That's a very catchy name. This is a tiny dim red dwarf. 
It's about the third the mass of the sun. It's about a third the size of the sun. Normally, it's about a thousandth the luminosity of the sun. But earlier this year, it went into a spectacular outburst where it went under succession of flares over a period of about 10 days, and some of these flares being long-lasting. Now, this is an X-ray picture of that star in one of these outbursts. And this tiny star output an outburst that was up to about 10 times, 10,000 times more luminous than any outburst we've seen on the sun. Now, this is just an animation, but it's showing you here is our, an out, one of the strongest outbursts that we've seen in our sun, and it's just showing you kind of that flare. And this is DGCVN and the equivalent of the outburst. Again, 10,000 times brighter than anything we see in the sun. And it went under a whole succession of these outbursts over a two-week period. This is incredible behavior for a tiny dim red star. It's relatively isolated, and we can only assume it's tied to very strong magnetic activity within the star. The release of energy is due to those magnetic fields knotting up, and then when they reconfigure, they release a huge amount of um, energy which can accelerate, well, it can produce all those sort of bright light and very energetic light towards us. So that's stars that flare, but then there are also stars that undergo much more regular pulsations in, in their brightness, a standard variability. Now, there are many different kinds of variable stars. And here, the brightness change isn't a one-off event. It's almost like a resonance that's built up within the star. So again, this is uh, just an artist's impression of one of these stars. And when you track the variations in brightness of the star, they track movements, you can tell from the Doppler shift of the light emitted from the surface, of the, su of the surface of the star moving out and in. So the star is physically pulsating and tracking those brightness changes. And it's to do with the amount of, well, it's how opaque the outer layers are as to how easily they let the light from the inside of the star escape. And so you have a natural balance. If the star is quite small, the heat builds up in the outer layers. Those outer layers get ionized, which basically means they become more and more opaque. They don't let the light from the inside of the star through. They heat up. If things heat up, they expand. The star physically swells and becomes bigger. But at that point, the outer layers thin down. They get cooler. They become more transparent to the radiation. They let more energy escape, and the star cools down, and it shrinks down in size. And it's almost like they're breathing. These stars will vary in their brightness for periods of days, if not weeks. And again, so these are physical mechanisms within the star. And these can be doing this over centuries of time. As long as we've been looking at stars through telescopes, we've seen these variable stars. Now, there are a very particular type called Cepheid variables. That's the most classic one of these variable stars. Again, this physical pulsating mechanism. Here are just some of the light curves. Now, a light curve, you're going to be seeing a few of these, I just warn you. It's a plot of brightness against time. And here they just marked it in phase, and that phase is just from one peak to the next. And you can see there are variations. It's not just bright dim, bright dim. Some of them have quite complicated little wiggles and little bounces. But again, it's, the re it's just the repeatability of this behavior. And one of the great things about these particular Cepheid variables is that the, the time from one peak to the next in this pulsation, or bright, you know, peak brightness, depends on the physical characteristics of the star. There's a direct correlation between the time from one peak to the next, so the periodicity of this variability, and how bright the star really is. It was discovered about 100 years ago by Henrietta Swan Leavitt. It's called the period luminosity relation. But basically what it tells you is the brighter the star, the longer the time delay between successive peaks. And this is really important. It has become hugely important for cosmology. You can look at distant galaxies. Here, for example, is M100, observed with the Hubble Space Telescope. It's about 12 million light years away. The fact I can say how far away it is with some degree of confidence is because of observations of Cepheid variables within the star. Sorry, within this galaxy. There's a tiny star here. Well, actually, it's quite a big star. It's quite a bright star. The fact that you can see it with the Hubble Space Telescope 12 million light years away tells you it's actually quite a giant star. But it's one of these Cepheid variables. Here you can see variations in its, uh, in its uh, luminosity. And by working out the period of the luminosity, 
You can work out how bright the star is intrinsically. You compare it to how bright it appears in your telescope. And the two are related by the distance squared. And so you get the distance to the host galaxy. So variable stars, many different varieties, hugely important to understand their characteristics in the nearby universe. So if you study nearby variable stars, you get an understanding perhaps of variable stars in more distant galaxies and perhaps a better determination of kind of things that any systematics that might affect your determination of the distance to those galaxies. Now, stars don't live in isolation. Sometimes they're in binaries. Very often they live in clouds of gas and dust that they were born from. So these are the remnants of the material, the cloud that originally formed them. And the stars erode the surface of these nebulae. Nebulae just meaning clouds in space, clouds of dust and gas in space. Here, for example, is just the edge of one of these clouds. High above the, project, well, the, the ceiling, there's very young, bright stars. They're light. They're winds of radiation, so winds of charged particles. Their energetic radiation are eating into the surface of the cloud. This will be changing all the time. But most of these nebulae are so far away that we don't see this erosion taking place from one observation to the next. The time scale is far too long. So even though we know that there's a physical erosion taking place, we're not actually seeing these nebulae change. But we do see nebulae change, not because the clouds are physically changing, but because the way they're illuminated changes. Let me introduce you to RS Puppis. It is another of these variable stars. It undergoes changes um, in its brightness by a factor of five on about a, a four-week, six-week period. So it goes very bright and very faint and very bright and very faint. And it's a massive star. It's about 10 times the mass of our sun. It's much bigger. It's about 200 times larger. And it's, as I say, it's very variable. You can see it's still surrounded by clouds of dust. And what happens is every time you get an increase in brightness, that light is reflected off the surrounding dust clouds. And this structure is big enough that it takes a time for that light to propagate out through the dust. And so you have a phenomenon known as a light echo, where you get a pulse of light from the star that is then reflected off some further parts of the dust cloud. And so you see these light pulses rippling out through the dusty nebulae. So again, this is very much sped over. This is kind of going over the six-week period. But as the star varies, those flashes of light get move on out through the cloud. And it looks like the cloud is moving, but it's just the light moving through the dust clouds. There are other examples. Here's a, I mean, so this is a variable star that's varying all the time. It's a very predictable pattern. Sometimes stars go into outbursts. So this isn't a flare on the surface. It's much more an intrinsic, huge release of light from the whole star. We don't necessarily know why, we, why they do them. And one such example is V838mon that's shown here. This underwent an outburst in 2002. We don't know why. It didn't go supernova. It didn't go nova. It didn't shed any material. It just went very bright, very intense for a short period of time and then faded away. What's happened since, though, is that that light has propagated out from that one burst. It's propagated out from the star. So I'm going to show you a movie that spans just a few years that's showing you how this light propagates out through the dust. It looks like the dust is moving and expanding away from the star, but it's not. It's the way that the light is moving out from the star and illuminating successively more distant layers of the dust. And as it does so, you can see fantastic structures within the dust. You can see kind of walls and eddies, and you can see perhaps ways that, um, you know, maybe the magnetic field in the gas clouds is kind of creating sort of lines and filaments within the dust clouds. Again, you're just illuminating stuff that normally you don't see very clearly, but this flash of light is just allowing us to map out the distribution of dust close to the star in great detail. So that's just one outburst from the star. There are other stars, like here you have um, Hubble's Variable Nebula. Despite the name, it was actually discovered by Herschel in 1783. It's called Hubble's Nebula because he was the one, so this is Edwin Hubble, the American astronomer, who studied this nebula. It's about a light year across. 
there's a very bright young star down here, completely embedded within the dust clouds. You can't actually see the star, you just see the light scattering off the surrounding dust in the nebula. Now, the shape of this nebula and its brightness changes, not because the star is itself intrinsically changing, but there are shadows across the gas that are created by stuff that's moving much closer into the star. Some of the stuff that's completely obscuring the star is then blocking some of that illumination from reaching the clouds, and so you have a play of shadows across the nebula which seem to affect its appearance all the time. So again, there the shape and the brightness of the nebula seems to change over periods of years. Other example here, this is Heinz Nebula. Again, it's, about, it's slightly bigger. It's about four light years across. This was discovered probably in about 1852 as quite a bright light source and then completely faded away again by the beginning of the, the last century. And then it began to start increasing brightness by the 1930s. And here again, you're looking at light reflected from a star at the core. Now, this is a very young star. It's buried in there, and that will undergo brightness variations. And so, again, it's the star varying in brightness affecting the dust clouds around it, except it's not as neat an RS Puppies in that you have a change in the star that maps to a change in the nebula. This one's a lot more complicated, and indeed we think there are other stars that we can't see that are buried deep within these clouds that are also affecting illumination of the clouds that may also be variable in itself. So it's not always as straightforward as a like echo of the dust clouds. Now, this star is called T Tauri, a very particular kind of star. It's a very young kind of star. And this is characteristic of, well, in fact, they're called T. Tauri stars after this namesake, of very young stars which produce jets just as they're forming. And these jets are a signature of very young stars. It's when a star is collapsing from a cocoon of material. It's still accreting material from the surrounding cocoon, Stuff is still falling under gravity, but it's beginning nuclear fusion at the core. And there's kind of a bit of imbalance between whether stuff is accreting or stuff is being blasted out. And not all the stuff that's accreting onto the star makes it onto the star. Some of it gets funneled out in twin jets. Now, these are very short-lived features where short, you know, remember this is astronomy, like less than a million years, perhaps. <laughs> a few hundred thousand years, a very young star will send out these collimated jets of material at high speed into the surroundings. Here you can see there's one buried within these clouds. It's only revealed by these jets. Here's another beautiful example in the Carina Nebula. There's a big pillar of gas and dust. You can see some kind of structures, and maybe extending right out here. Only when you look through the infrared, do you see that deep in the cloud there's a young star that's producing these jets. So very often the star itself is obscured. You can only see these jets. So we can watch these Herbig Harrow objects, as they're known. There's the Herbig Harrow objects are the jets that come out from the stars. It's named after a couple of astronomers who studied them intensely in the 1950s. And you can actually see changes within these jets. Now, the star is down here somewhere. It's completely obscured. And it's spewing out this long jet of material. And there are different things you can watch within this jet. First of all, you can see how material is given off at the start and then how the jet expands, and then you have a working surface where that jet hits material in interstellar medium around it. And by mapping out all these changes over a period of years, you can track different things that are going on. For a start, when you look at the material being given off within this jet, you know it's not coming out, it's not pouring out in a continual stream, it's blobby. So that's telling you something about the sporadic nature of material falling onto the star and fueling these jets. Then as the star, as the jet expands out, so here's another Herbig Harrow object, here's this jet. If I show you a movie of this particular jet in HH34, you can see changes within the jet itself. As material slams into the surrounding environment, the interstellar medium, it gets slowed down. You know, so these are relativistic jets that come out, the working surface against the interstellar medium slows down, and then you get these other lumps in the jet, which almost like rear-end it, you know, slam into that, because these are slow and these are still moving fast. So you get jocks, sorry, you get shocks and jolts within the jet that heat the gas and then cool it. So you can look at shocks and how shocks work on gas plasma. And then finally, you can also look at the interface where 
this jet is putting energy into the interstellar medium. And so all of this together, I mean, I'll just show you a couple more nice ones here of these, these uh, interfaces. You're finding out a lot more about how jet works, how they are created, how they input energy into their surroundings, how, what happens within the jet. Now, jets, as you discover, is the main feature about a lot of objects in astronomy. These are examples that are relatively nearby, relatively easy to study, and study those changes. And so by understanding these jets, we, or trying to understand these jets, we get a much better view of what might be happening, how you might launch jets, how they might propagate, what's important in physics in jets when you're studying objects that are halfway across the universe. So these are stars that are doing transient behavior, changeable behavior. They're also stars that undergo not just the outburst that you saw, you know, just a one-off outburst within its life, but also mark the end of a star's life. If you have a star like our sun, it ends its life with a brief, blash, a brief blast known as a nova, or new star. A more spectacular one of these is a supernova. And these are very rare occurrences indeed. You can tell from this uh, woodcut here from the 16th century that obviously if one goes off, everybody goes out in the street and points at it. Uh, this is, a, is depicting a supernova, a very famous one from 1572. We call it Tycho's supernova because Tycho Brahe was one of the astronomers, well, the astronomer who studied it in great detail and published data on it proving that these, very, you know, these new stars in the sky weren't comets without tails. They were truly something happening to a star. When this star appears in the sky... It rivaled Venus in brightness. It lasted for about two years. These are really, truly remarkable events when they happen, and they're not that common. We reckon going back through history, there have probably only been 10 recorded. So these are 10, which, or less than 10 even, that were visible to the unaided eye, which means they're supernovae going off within our galaxy. And a supernova is when you have a very massive star, one that's much more massive than our sun, undergoing the end of its life where it throws off the outer layers and the core of the, the star collapses down to form a neutron star or a, white, uh, or a black hole. So these are very rare events. Um, just to show you, this one is actually in the constellation of Cassiopeia. I must just show you this picture from one of the atlases we hold in the Institute of Astronomy Library, which was published shortly afterwards, where again you have the constellation of Cassiopeia and there's the supernova just marked for posterity on the map. Another of these supernova happened in 1054. Again, the appearance of a guest star was seen and recorded by um, Japanese, Chinese, um, Arabic astronomers at the time. Didn't seem to be observed from European astronomers. And later, you find that patch of the sky where they recorded this huge outburst. Again, a star that lasted for two years, phenomenally bright. You could see it, you couldn't miss it with the unaided eye. It's later identified with this fuzzy blob, which is a supernova remnant. So this is the debris from the star that is then expanding outwards at phenomenal speed now. Um, so it's the ejector, the outer layers of the star, the center's collapsing down, and in fact, right at the center here, we think there's one of those is a neutron star but you have this remnant that's moving apart. Now, this is a comparatively nearby object. Remember, you could see it with the unaided sky. It's only about 6,500 light years away. This amount of material, so this whole nebula, it's about 10 light years across. And the ejector in it are still moving out at the speeds of 1,000 kilometers per second. When you get something that's moving quite that fast, big enough and near enough, this is something where we can begin to see changes in the nebula and the shape of the nebula over a period of a few decades. So this little movie compares two images of the supernova separated by about 15 years. Okay, one is slightly deeper than the other, but if you concentrate around the outwards, you can begin the outer parts, you can begin to see material still beginning to move outwards. And we can track the expansion and the changes within this supernova remnant. Now, we no longer have to rely on serendipity, you know, waiting for a supernova to go off right next to us in our galaxy, or, a or that we happen to be looking at the right galaxy when one happens to go off. Remember, these are rare events. We reckon on average there's about one per galaxy per century. They're quite difficult to see that instant 
when they happen to explode. But again, we have now got an era of robotic observation. We have telescopes which automatically survey the sky or survey individual galaxies all the time, likely galaxies where we think supernovae might happen, and catch the, mo the night that, you know, a difference between a galaxy from one night to the next shows us that there's been a supernova outburst. And these explosions are so bright, you can see them in distant galaxies halfway across the universe. They're incredibly important objects. So here, for example, you can see a supernova that's embedded within this galaxy. Again, here's a before and after. Before, after. If you've got the, the picture of the galaxy before and the picture afterwards, then you can start to do a lot more science as well about where the supernova's gone off and the kind of progenitor star that's caused it. Here, for example, is a transient from the Palomar Transient Factory. Again, one of these automated telescopes scanning the sky, looking for supernova all the time. And it's important that we find supernovae. They are of crucial importance for cosmology. Certain types of supernova in distant galaxies, again, the amount of energy released in the explosion is about the same. The time taken for the light to dim tells us something about the energy released in the explosion, how bright the supernova is, again, tells us something about the distance to far-off galaxies. We need to really understand supernovae. So observing them in nearby galaxies and observing the changes and how this explosion happens will tell us how to interpret these observations with far more distant galaxies. I would just say we don't have to rely on automated exposures all the time. You can still get lucky. This is a picture of M82. This is a exposure from earlier this year in January. This object is about 12 million light years away from us. There's a supernova in this galaxy. And this was discovered um, from an observatory that belongs to UCL. And I reckon this is probably about the only major observational discovery made from the centre of London in several centuries. <laughs> and again, it's serendipity, but again... Very smart people picking up that something has changed in the galaxy and detecting a supernova going off quite near to us. And again, here's the before and after. You can see the change. You can see the star. And what we learn from supernova, well, first of all, obviously, understanding supernova tells us something about the very distant supernova and the kind of things we want to understand about supernova. First of all, is to understand what star gave rise to the explosion. There are a whole host of possibilities about how a supernova arrives. There are a whole host of possible progenitors, you know, supergiant stars, different masses, different types. And again, if they're nearby and you've got the before and after, you can identify the progenitor star. In this case, it's a blue supergiant. And you get an idea of what stars go on to create supernova. That tells you whereabouts in a galaxy these stars might be. And indeed, when you look at some of these objects, you can see that they're associated with regions of um, active star formation within the galaxy. When you get a supernova, you want to follow it up immediately. Okay, bright slide coming up, just to warn you. Looking at the way that the light, so this is a light curve, your supernova explosion has happened off there somewhere. This is brightness against time. Looking at the way the light decays tells you what kind of supernova it is. Uh, it tells you something about the total energy that's been released. That energy is released into the interstellar medium. So you're tracking the input of energy within the environment of the galaxy, not just that. Remember, these very massive stars are where you form very um, massive elements, you know, iron and beyond. And then those are redistributed. You form like the core of the star when it's doing fusion. They also form within the supernova explosion. They're then redistributed into the interstellar medium. Mapping what kind of stars give rise to supernova, where the supernova is happening, allows you to track a whole process of energy and chemical enrich enrichment within a galaxy. There's a whole field called galactic ecology, where you're looking at the star, you're tracking the star formation history across a galaxy from potential supernova, past supernova, and working the star formation history within that galaxy. The other thing, of course, is that you can track changes not just in the brightness of the supernova, but of its spectrum. The looking analyzing the light from the star. And this can change. You go in a period of days. I mean, again, this is just 
symptomatic. What I'm trying to demonstrate is that it changes from about seven days up to about half a year later. And the kind of changes we're seeing in the nature of the light from the stars, you start off with something that's very obscured, absorbing a lot of the light, to stuff then the shockwave hits it and it begins to glow and it gives off emission lines, it gives, radiates of its own accord. So you can track, again, the physical process of this explosion expanding out into the local environment and how it's affecting it. One of the most spectacular observations, a supernova we've seen recently, happened in February 1987. And it occurred 170,000 light years away in this companion galaxy to our own galaxy. This is the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's got a huge star formation region here. If I zoom in, this is known as the Tarantula Nebula, for reasons that might look fairly obvious. And just above the center here, this is supernova 1987A. And this is one weird object. I mean, here, if I just zoom in, OK? These, are these headlights are really just stars in the foreground. They're part of our galaxy. Um, we're looking past those stars to the object that lies behind them. And you have a supernova explosion that's occurred there. We caught the light outburst. It was accompanied by a detection of a whole lot of neutrinos at the same time. That was great validation of some understanding of supernova explosions, the idea that a lot of the energy is carried away in supernova, um, by neutrinos, as well as from the light. And we've since been monitoring this supernova to see how it changes and evolves. And it changes in different ways. This blob in the center is that supernova remnant, the debris from the star expanding out. And it's glowing through. It's being heated by radioactive decay. You can also see it expanding out. It's the ejector moving something like 7,000 kilometers per second at the minute. So again, we can see that change and evolve and grow with time. But there isn't just the ejector moving out. There's also a blast wave that then goes out and collides with the surroundings. And the surroundings are strange. First of all, the light from the supernova illuminated a ring of material that's about a light year wide around the star. Now, this is pre-existing. It's just that supernova light has just lit it up. And we think it's been given off by the star, but it was kind of experimenting with the idea of going supernova in advance. It's given off this ring of material about 20,000 years ago. And it's now just being lit up. But then, beyond being lit up, there's a, there's a blast wave that comes out, and it collides with this ring. And as it does so, it excites the ring and causes it to glow. And that glows very strongly, not just in the optical, but also in x-rays. Here's just a schematic of what's going on. Here's your ring of material. Then you have the shock wave that moves out from the star. So this is not the ejector, but the actual blast wave. And as it slams into that pre-existing ring of material, it's causing it to glow, causing it to give off lots of x-rays and lots of energetic light. And beyond that, there's other weird structure. Oh, OK, well, again, you can map out the changes. After three years after this explosion, you can see emission from that ring glowing within the spectrum. You can see changes within the nature of the stuff being given off. And then beyond that, there's something else we're quite curious about. We've got these two rings, like a flattened eight, which we think are part of, again, that pre-existing explosion from the star. What we're waiting now for is the light propagates out from the center. We're hoping it's going to start illuminating some of this other structure which we believe to be given off from that earlier explosion of the star. So this is an ongoing project, one of the nearest examples for a long while that we can study in any great detail. And then there are stars which haven't yet gone supernova, but might well in the future. This star here is Eta Carina. It's about 7,500 light years away. And 170 years ago, it was the, bright, it was the second brightest star in the sky. After Sirius, which is only six and a half light years away, so remember, this is 7,500 light years away, and it was rivaling Sirius in brightness. So it started to increase in brightness in the sort of early part of the 19th century. It reached a peak in 1843, and then faded away very quickly afterwards to go um, you know, much, much fainter. It's been then varying a bit since the last century, but nothing like that huge outburst. It's a massive star. We reckon it's got a mass of about 120 times that of the sun. And in this outburst, it gave off probably about 10 to 20 solar masses of material, forming, again, this kind of surrounding cocoon going off in a double-lobe direction. 
And this amazing outburst of material was observed at the time the luminosity tracked. It shed this material. But again, we have a light echo from this explosion. Here's the star. There's a little patch of dust cloud down here. If I just zoom in on that, you can see there are a couple of stars. There's some light. This is about 100 light years away. And you're seeing, again, a light echo of this explosion. So most of the light came straight towards us, but some went back, got reflected of a dust cloud, and then sent back to us. And just over a period of years, we can now observe this super, this it wasn't supernova, but this outburst from Eta Carina reflected off these clouds, like this. And the variation exactly tracks what, what, what happened in the 1840s. And this is a very exciting development. By looking at reflected light, you can now go back and revisit past supernova explosions, outbursts of these stars, but with much better telescopes than were available 170 years ago. By analysing the light of these clouds, we can actually now go back, wind time back, and observe the light given off by a phenomenon, even though we're somewhat after the event. So this is a growing uh, way of doing uh, quite interesting science and kind of getting round the idea that we, we can observe things much better now than we could then. So I've concentrated mainly on visible objects, things that are powered by nuclear fusion, You've, of course, got variants in all of the wave bands. If you look in the radio sky, there are many thousands of transient sources flicking on and off each day. Some of them are incredibly fast. In the radio, you get transients that happen on the time scale of probably just about nanoseconds, milliseconds. Here again, our light curves. Look, this is time in milliseconds, and you get a huge outburst that then tails away. If you have a burst of light that fast, it's very difficult to track down where it was or what it was that gave off the source. We don't really know. The only thing we do know is when we look at the signal as it arrives, it's what's known as dispersed. As you look at the time, different frequencies, some frequencies arrive sooner and some frequencies arrive later. You get the spread of radio signal if it's been traveling through an electrically charged plasma. By the amount of dispersion, you can work out how much material it's traveled through. When you look at these fast radio sources, the signals are so dispersed, they've traveled through far more material that's available in the interstellar medium of our galaxy. So we think these are extragalactic sources, but very little else is known. We stand a much better chance of identifying slow varying sources. Some of these are associated with supernova explosions, so again, a one off event. Others are much more variable. Things are flickering on and off. And this is where we get onto the much more variable activity that is associated not necessarily with stars on their own, but with compact objects, and in particular, gravitational accretion. That most of these sources are varying not just in the radio, but also in the X-ray and other wave bands. And it's to do with not the amount of nuclear fusion changing, but gravitational accretion pulling material from a co one companion onto an object like a white dwarf, a neutron star, or a black hole. And the flickering is most obvious, perhaps, in the X-rays. This is from a mission called RXTE, which specifically looks for, light, looks for variation in X-ray sources across the sky. You're looking at the whole sky and wrap. Time is being sped up. But you can see some are kind of regularly varying with some them to go outburst you get a whole range of different variability behavior. You first detected this transient behavior in the radio, because radio astronomy is older than X-ray, but again, it's difficult to pinpoint down the source. Soon with the X-rays, began to detect transient sources by the late 1960s, but again, pinpointing exactly what the source is had to wait till you got much better chance of um, identification, much better positional accuracy of the X-ray sources. And the kind of variability behavior you get, again, it varies hugely. Here are some light curves. You get enormous outbursts. You get sources that can change in their brightness by about a factor of 100,000 within minutes to hours and then fade away again and nothing happens. You've got other ones that undergo regular outbursts from the same source. And then others which just kind of poodle along, flickering all the time. And all of this is characteristic of gravitational accretion. What you have is you have sources that are varying because the flow of material onto the surface of the compact object is varying. So, for example, you maybe have material torn off the star in 
different, you know, lumpy chunks. And so you have variation in the supply. The stream onto the compact object will be variable. It'll be chaotic. You'll have shocks within that that, again, heat and create this light. As the material hits the accretion disk or actually falls onto the surface of the neutron star, you will get bursts of light. It's a chaotic, it's a sort of randomized behavior. But by studying the variability, you begin to get a nature of the fuel, an idea of the nature of the fuel supply from one star to these objects. So when you manage to get X-ray identifications, I mean, the reason that we know that these uh, accretion onto compact objects is by the time you get to optical follow-up, you begin to see that they're all binary systems. And generally, in terms of X-rays, you can put them into two kinds. You, and it depends on the donor. You've got a compact object, which is a neutron star or a black hole, and it's pulling material off the star. The low-mass X-ray binaries are the kind of ordinary ones. Well, you can never call anything next to an or a neutron star or a black hole ordinary. But you've got your compact object, you've got your fairly low-mass star nearby. Material is just being pulled off it all the time under gravity. The star is swelled up to be as big as it can, and material is just being funneled on to the compact object. Again, you're looking at the variabilities tracing that flow of matter and how it falls onto the star and the whole nature of, of accretion of material onto, you know, sometimes cases of extreme gravity around a black hole or a neutron star. Beyond that, you get donors that are not just um, ordinary stars, but say supergiant stars. So maybe here you have two supergiant stars. One under has got undergone a supernova, become a black hole or a neutron star and is then pulling material from its giant companion. Now, it could just be pulling material from the surface. It could also be that there are winds from the star, and that's perhaps clumpy, and the variation you get is from clumpy winds, and it could also be that the stars don't go round each other in neat circles, but in very eccentric orbits. Sometimes they're a long way away to, apart from each other. Sometimes they're quite close. You can begin to think of any nature of things that can vary the supply of material. So all of these map out different possible combinations. You're mapping out perhaps the evolution of binary stars. But by studying these kind of objects, again, you're tracing the past star formation history of a galaxy. These kind of sources are found in, again, spiral arms of galaxies where you've had recent star formation, especially the high mass X-ray binaries. You're talking about very massive stars to have lived through their lives, to have collapsed down to be a neutron star, or um, a black hole, you're looking at recent star formation activity. And so you can see the stars that are forming now, but by looking at the compact objects, which are revealed through their variability, you begin to see what star formation has happened in the past, what kind of stars there are, and what kind of stars give rise to these variable objects. And again, these are mini miniature versions of what's going on perhaps in distant galaxies where you've got the supermassive black hole at the core. Again, you're looking at variable accretion onto the central supermassive black hole. These are nearby objects, and you can compare the variability and all the characteristics of these that help you interpret what's going on in much more distant objects. It's much easier to study a small thing in the galaxy near to you than something that's halfway across the universe and embedded right at the center of the galaxy. So it's a matter of understanding that extreme physics and this physics of gravitational accretion. So even these, though, aren't the most dramatic kinds of variability. So even though they, they fluctuate on these minute time scales, there are objects which are more extreme. X-rays are very energetic photons. Beyond that, you get gamma ray objects, things which release so much radiation is the highest possible energy particle, um, energy photons, which are gamma ray light. Here's a picture of the sky in gamma rays, false colors. Unwrap the whole sky. This is the position of the galaxy. You can see there are sources like supernova remnants, pulsars, things which are producing lots of gamma ray emission. But there are also lots of gamma ray bursts which are happening all the time. And these, amazingly, were discovered serendipitously in the 1960s by satellites which were monitoring Earth. They were looking for violations of the Test Ban Treaty. So you had Russian and American satellites that are looking for huge flashes of radiation within Earth's atmosphere, which would reveal that somebody detonated a nuclear explosion, broken the Test Ban Treaty. When not monitoring the Earth, though, these satellites would slew and scan across the sky. So they also made astronomical observations. 
And when the data become, became declassified, they were released to astronomers, and they reveal the presence of these gamma ray bursts. Now, these go on all the time across the sky, anywhere in the sky, and just for that moment that they go off, they can be the brightest source in all the sky. But here's just one that's... Um, it's, it, it's not one that's going periodically, it's the same movie on a wrap. Here's another thing where, again, it shows you the light curve, huge outburst of material within very short periods of time. And we're talking time scales of a few seconds for some of them, going up to perhaps a few tens of seconds. Huge energetic radiation, all released in a very short period of time. The question, though, is what are these sources? And it's very difficult to identify. Gamma rays, like X-rays, are incredibly difficult to detect. The photons have got so much energy, they kind of pass through conventional telescopes. You have to be able to identify where, you know, where they are in the sky, what possible source that might have originated them before you can begin to understand you know, where they come from, what creates them. Now, the first thing you could tell by the fact they occur all around the sky, so this is a later experiment called BAT-C, which went up, okay, sorry, a little bit later, which went up in the 1990s. This is the spatial position across the sky of about 2,700 of these gamma ray sources. And the first thing you see is they're everywhere. They're not confined to where the galaxy appears in the sky. That in itself gives you the biggest clue that these are extragalactic. They're not things happening within our own galaxy. They are things that are happening incredibly far away, which is kind of worrying if they're that luminous and they're also that far away. The other thing is when you look at the time for them, I've told you that some of them are very fast. Again, here a whole selection of light curves. Brightness against time. This is time in seconds. Some of them will undergo an outburst, which is less than two seconds. Incredibly fast. Others will maybe take a few tens of seconds and just decay away. And it makes a huge difference as to whether you can follow them up. The very fast transients, you probably have no hope of working out what gave off that source. With the slower ones, you can begin to get a better positional identification. And this work really started taking off perhaps in the late 1990s. We knew about these gamma ray bursts, but trying to track down what they were came along much later and needed better both X-ray telescopes to be able to detect the burst of X-rays that accompanied the gamma ray burst, and then also to get better positional information for follow-up and other wave bands. And the thing that enables this is that those slower transients, these are the ones with slightly less energy, they last slightly longer, they tend to have what's known as an afterglow. You've got this brilliant blush of, flash of gamma rays, and it's followed by a kind of then glow in other wave bands. Here, for example, is a, a, a burst seen in X-rays. This is about two and a half million times more luminous than a supernova. I mean, this really is a huge burst of radiation. You can, you've had the gamma ray burst, there's an afterglow in X-rays, then in the ultraviolet, and it goes through progressively other wave bands down to optical and radio. Here's the afterglow in a distant galaxy of a gamma ray burst. Here, there's the galaxy, and, well, okay, it doesn't come out so well in this picture, but there's a little hint of an afterglow there which fades away by another month. And these afterglows will last weeks and months. It's not long. You've got to follow up the gamma ray burst immediately, but you can begin to see and identify where they came from, where abouts in a galaxy they are. You can track the light curves. Here, for example, is one where these are two foreground stars. That's your galaxy. That's the gamma ray burst. By mapping out the variation, you get the light curve. You can begin to associate it with certain kinds, perhaps this one, this particular one looks like a kind of supernova explosion. When you get the radio spectral information from these sources, you find that you get the kind of radio emission you associate with a very explosive, relativistic expanding object. And so that tells you it's some kind of a highly energetic explosion, such that stuff is moving at relativistic speeds out from the source. Now, with these identifications comes knowledge of the distance. And what has been found is that all these slow gamma ray bursts do not or originate within our galaxy. They come from outside our galaxy. They're at enormous distances. Here's one that's been identified fairly recently. This 
object this ringed is the identification of a gamma ray burst that occurred when the universe was only about 630 million years old. So these are so bright, you can see them across the universe. So again, if we can understand nearby examples, what does it tell us about the early universe if we can see these gamma ray bursts going on in the very early galaxies? So again, it's understanding what's going on will help us interpret the more distant universe. But with the great distance comes great luminosity. And we have a problem about these gamma ray bursts. The fact that they are so bright, they release so much energy, and they are so distant means that they're inherently far too luminous for any kind of sensible mechanism to release that much energy in such a short time. And you can get around this by saying, well, maybe that, that light isn't radiated in all directions equally, but the source is quite beamed. It's collimated into a narrow beam, and you just see the gamma ray burst if that's pointed towards you. And if you reduce that beam width to, sort of, instead of being all around the sky, but to be only about one degree across, you'd need probably, you can reduce the luminosity by a factor of 50,000, which is good. That's getting almost to the range where we might be able to think of things that could power that burst. It also means that there are a lot more of them in the sky that we don't see. That means we only see it about one in a 50,000 because it happens to be pointed towards us. So these are still quite rare occurrences, but perhaps not as rare as the time that we see them. And when you look at the progenitor galaxies that are giving rise to them, these gamma ray bursts tend to come from regions of active recent star formation. So again, it tells you something about the fact that we think they're connected to star formation and the fact that the radio tells us that it's some kind of explosive event. We tend to associate them with the death of massive stars. But by massive, I'm talking stars that are 50 to 100 times the mass of our sun. And even so, there isn't enough energy just from the supernova and core collapse in itself. You also, if you're going to collimate the light, again, sorry, I should have said artist impression, if you're going to collimate this light, you need to launch jet at the same time as you've got the core collapse. You've got to create a black hole at the center very quickly, dump a whole lot of stuff onto the black hole, and tap that energy. So there's an awful lot that's going on. Current theories, certainly for the slow transients, revolve around hypernova, which is one of these very massive stars. Again, uh, artist's impression, but this is just a concept of what might be going on where you do have a massive star at the end of its life. It's undergoing that core collapse to the black hole. But at the same time, maybe because it's a very fast rotator, you've got a preferential dumping of material onto the black hole as it forms from the surroundings that uh, creates a huge outburst. Not just that, you've also got to launch these jets somehow at the same time that collimate that energy outwards. And the natural thing with jets is you think of a fast rotator. So there are many models, but it is a challenge to get that much luminosity out of that kind of source. For the faster ones, there are possibilities that you have binary... Oh, and just to say, the afterglow comes from as the jets hit the surrounding material. Other possibilities for the faster sources... Now, this is far more speculative, but imagine you've got a binary system where two objects have collapsed into neutron stars. They may be, if they spiral, they might eventually merge. And that moment of merging would create the very rapid, the very transient release of energy that's the gamma ray burst. It's much quicker. And you don't have the afterglow because the previous supernova kind of cleared all the material out of the surroundings. But how you launch the jets, again, don't really know. Or if you don't like neutron star, neutron star, you can have a neutron star and a black hole. You can see it gets speculative. But these are the kind of exotic physics we need to appeal to to get this much energy from these explosions. But even these are not the most dramatic explosions. My final ones I've got to tell you about are called magnetars. And these are a soft gamma ray burst that is so intensely bright, very few of them have been observed. They're so bright that telescopes that are detecting for gamma ray bursts, the detectors will be saturated. Some of them will shut into safety mode. Um, for example, this is the, the light burst of you've got very intense bursts and then a kind of oscillation. This is another one from 2004 again. This goes up to 20 times higher. You can't plot it on the same graph. And all of this is happening within just about a couple of minutes. This, um, with, with these kind of extreme outbursts, you can have a telescope looking the other way 
and it is saturated by the reflected gamma rays that are reflected from the moon. Okay? Huge outbursts. And these are with so much energy that they rattle the Earth's ionosphere. They actually excite the, the atoms in the Earth's ionosphere. And you can see vibrations with, uh, affecting Earth's atmosphere. And certainly with this one, this one's slightly near. It's only about 5,000 light years away. In about 0.1 of a second, it releases the same amount of energy as the sun releases every 100,000 years. Enormous explosions. And these are ordinary gamma ray bursts. And explanations for these are that you have an extremely magnetized neutron star. You know, maybe one that's 100 to 1,000 times more strongly magnified and magnetized than an ordinary neutron star. And then you're talking something that's maybe 1,000 trillion times the Earth's magnetic field. If you have movements on the surface, if you have star quakes, again, any motion will release um, or, or re-knot up or unreleased magnetic field knots that will, again, accelerate huge bursts of radiation out into space. Extreme events, and we need to observe more of these to understand the source. And these are truly the most spectacular transients. So just very briefly, I hope I've given you an idea of the kinds of things we study, but this is going to get even better. There are many facilities coming in line. In the radio, we've got LOFAR, a new radio telescope network of about 25,000 antennae spread across eight countries. It can detect 60% of the sky every night looking for radio transients. That's already operational. The start of the next decade, we'll have the world's largest telescope, the Square Kilometre Array, an artist's impression, but that will be wonderful for radio transients. Within the X-rays, we are already scanning the sky. This is Maxi on the space station, Japanese mission that scans the X-ray sky every 96 minutes looking for transients. Future X-ray missions, such as the recently approved Athena mission, not just, don't just detect the outburst, but can slew very rapidly to point at it and detect X-rays afterwards and do the follow-up and the positional work necessary. We have gamma ray telescopes already in orbit, launched in 2004, 2008. These are the ones that are producing those data on those bursts and will carry on operating, detecting gamma rays and giving us those pinpoint observations. Again, scanning the skies all the time. We have the Gaia satellite, which is looking across the whole galaxy over the next five years, specifically looking for transient supernova events, variable stars, and other activity, again, looking for alerts for, follow, um, for ground-based follow-up. But the real game-changer on the horizon is this. The large... Oh, I'm going to name them. Synoptic Survey Telescope. It is going to be fantastic. It's in the design phase. It's approved. should come operational at the beginning of the next decade. This telescope is, can detect very faint objects within 15 seconds. It's going to have the world's largest camera on that can, at one image, look at the size of the sky. It's about the width of seven um, diameters of the moon. That means that one of these images will be equivalent to about 3,000 Hubble Space Telescope images. It will be able to map the sky twice a week. They reckon within its first week of operation, it will already detect 400 supernova. Within the first few months, it'll pick up 4,000 supernova. Not just that, you've got to have all the automated software to catalogue and monitor all these events. This is the game changer, and this is telling us that this is where the future lies. The future really is in time domain astronomy. And I'd just like to flag that I shall be giving the missing talk on the sun next Wednesday, same time, same place. Thank you very much. <laughs>